welcome to United Church Online. We're glad that you've joined us today. If you are new to United Church, we'd love to stay in touch with you. So why don't you fill out the connect card in the description or visit our website for more information. Get your Bibles, notebooks, and pens ready and let's receive the word together. Jesus, help us to, to care about people. Jesus, help us to hear the cries. Help us to see the hurts. And so your theme for this year is reach. And, uh, and Jesus is saying to us this morning, and he's saying to you, take my hand and I will show you. And so that's what I want to show you is how Jesus would lead us today through his word, how he would lead us through his teaching, through his demonstration. And in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 1 to 4, Jesus speaks about giving to the needy. And then he goes directly from there to verse 5 in Matthew 6, and he says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Do not be like them. Uh, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And immediately Jesus says, there's a particular way in which we ought to live. There's a particular people that we ought to be. And, and then Jesus teaches them to pray. He goes like, well, let's learn how to pray. But it's almost like, let's learn how to pray out of what I've just said. All right? And he said, this is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Everybody say, your kingdom come. And he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God says, don't be like some people, but let's be like what heaven is like. Not a bad idea. Let's recalibrate our thinking and our actions according to what Jesus intends for our world. Jesus looks at our world and he has a particular viewpoint about it and he has a desired response for it. And James, the brother of Jesus, carries on with this theme in James 1, verse 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word. Come, how many of you have heard more than 10 sermons? Yep. Two people. Yep. This is a brand new church. <laughs> or you don't preach sermons in this church. How many of you have heard more than 10 sermons? Come, all right. How many of you have heard more than one sermon? Yep. No, less hands went up. You guys don't understand me at all. <laughs> Let me do Chinese. Ni hao mao. <laughs> <laughs> Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do it, man. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what it looks like. That's not Alzheimer's. Merely forgets what it looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law and that gives freedom and continues in it. Come on, who does it? Walks the talk. Not forgetting what they have heard but doing it. Can everybody say, do it, man? Do it. Bit of a Jamaican, the Olympics is on. Somebody say, do it, man. <laughs> South Africa just got to say that, got a bronze medal yesterday. Yeah, for the, for the Springboks, seven aside. Oh, you obviously don't like rugby, yeah. All right. Are you, are you not South Africans? Come on. They will be blessed in what they do. Verse 27, religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So being religious, talking about the kingdom is not enough. It requires action and change. There's a, there's a saying, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. You know, don't just tell us, show us. Looking after widows and orphans is not just a New Testament idea. In the Old Testament, the covenant community of Israel is charged with the care of the poor and the helpless, the oppressed, the disenfranchised. When the members of the covenant community do not fulfill the obligation, the Lord hears the cry of the oppressed and responds by sending his prophets to call the people to repentance. I mean, it's incredible. God sees and hears the cries, sees the, the lack of response, and then he says, I've got to do something about it. I, I, I cannot leave things as they are. I need to. That's why God doesn't leave you where you are. He comes to you where you are to take you to where you should be. Yeah. That's who God is. Yeah. But he also does that for the disenfranchised, for the broken, the hurt, the blind, the, the lame, and the, the cripple. As far back as Exodus, we see God writing preferential treatment and protection into the law for certain people in need, specifically the widow and the orphan. And God states that he will hear the cry of the afflicted widows and orphans. And this is crazy stuff. He says, I will kill the afflictors with a sword. Ooh, that's hardcore Old Testament. They're right there. But Exodus 22, let's look at it in case you don't believe me, especially for the new visitors. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword and your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. And I'm going like, all right, let's move on to the New Testament. 
No, what God is saying, this is important to me. God is saying this is important. As part of the covenant, the Lord commanded the Israelites in no uncertain terms to care for the helpless and the vulnerable among them. Throughout the Old Testament, we see the same theme and emphasis. This is not just Old Testament, by the way. It's all the way through the New Testament. Psalm 68 verse 5 says this. Let's look at the Old Testament just to get an idea. The fa- he's a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. Is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. You know, I ask, over the years, I ask people, why are you joining Life Church? Every person that, that's coming into membership, coming to partnership, will say the same thing. It's because this is a family. Because this is a family. And I, that's the answer that I'm always looking for. That we are a family. We're a, we're a family for the fatherless. We're a family for the broken. We're a family for the hurting. We're the family for the disenfranchised. We're a family for anybody in the community. From the hill, we call the people in the hill, the wealthy people and the people who live in, this, in, the, in the poorer areas. We're a church for all people. Isaiah 1 verse 17 says, learn to do right, seek justice. I like that. Learn to do right. Which means we don't always know how to do it. But you know, why don't we just start going in that direction? We, 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 can't figure, we don't know exactly how it's all going to roll out and how we're going to make a difference. But let's just start. People look at what we're doing today and say, how do you do all of this? How did it all start? One life at a time. How do you do it now? One life at a time. How will you do it in 20 years? Well, I don't know if I'll be around. One life at a time. Malachi 3 verse 5 says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I'll be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in their wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the alien. Now that's not uh, E.T. The alien is just those who come from another country. And do not fear me, says the Lord. What you have to understand here today is that justice and righteousness, because that's what we're speaking about, these are the attributes of God. This is who God is. If you want to know what God is like, well, God is a defender of the fatherless and the widow. God is a defender of the broken, the disenfranchised. God is one who, who stands for those who don't have a voice. God is, you know, he is God to people. But aren't you glad that God is who he is to you? Isn't, aren't you glad that God saved you, rescued you, helped you? I, I was very lost when I was found. Because people say, you know what, I found Jesus uh, five years ago. Well, he was never lost. He found you. You were lost. And so justice and righteousness are attributes of God. The scriptures teach that the origins of these ideals, these ideals are described as the foundations of creation. And the Psalms describe justice and judgment as the attributes of God. Attributes that prescribe the values of his creation and his children. Psalm 68 verse 5 describes God as a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows. Psalm 89 verse 11 says the following, The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world all, and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. Tabar and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, high your right hand, righteous and justice. Are the f- By the way, how many of you are happy that God is a strong God? That God is a fair God, that God is a just God, that He's a caring God. All these attributes. Well, then don't get heavy about this attribute of God. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy, come on, everybody show me some happy faces. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance. This is who God is, and God says, I love it when my people become just like me. And do what I do. And do what I love. And love what I, that's why God says, love the, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. What's the second greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love people, love the society, love community, love the hurting and the broken, unless you love God. And if you really love God, trust me. The image of the Lord's children walking in his light suggests that they should adopt these divine attributes of justice and judgment. Throughout the Psalms, God promises to deliver the oppressed. For example, in Psalm 103, verse 6, in the ESV translation, it says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Psalm 146. I love it when we go Bible. Are you enjoying the Bible this morning? Yes. All right, it says in verse 7, he, Who executes justice? 
Because this is talking about God. It is God who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. And the Lord loves the righteous. And the Lord watches over the sojourners. And he upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. God is moving, working, watching, and doing. And in Ezekiel 16, we learn of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. How many of you know about Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, in, the, in the modern translation, it's Van der Bell Park. Is it not? Did I get it wrong? <laughs> Definitely not Cape Town. No, no, in all seriousness, every town, every city without God is a lost cause, right? Ezekiel 16 verse 49 says, Behold, this is what the iniquity of your sister. So we all know what Sodom and Gomorrah is famous for. Right? This, is, was, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Pride, you never knew this, over an abundance of food, prosperous ease, and idleness were hers and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. I bet you didn't know that about Sodom and Gomorrah. What would be said about our towns? Isaiah taught the Israelites that it was through these characteristics of compassion and mercy that they would recognize the Messiah. Isaiah said, how will, one day in hundreds of years' time, this is how you'll recognize the Messiah, the Messiah. Interesting. How will you be recognized? How will people know who you are, who you, whose you are, and who you represent? Isaiah 61 says, the Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord is on me because, everybody say because. because. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim, you know, we need more of God. People sing that song. We need more of God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the anointing. We need a move of God. But you've got to be careful for when you pray that prayer and sing that song. Because, because. There's a because that comes to this. The Lord, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. So Jesus goes, you know, at the start of his ministry, he goes in the wilderness, fasts and prays, struggles, and phenomenal things happen. And uh, he managed to overcome the, the temptations in the wilderness. He's strengthened by the Holy Spirit. The angels come and strengthen him, feed him. And he walks into the temple. As he walks into the temple, the people give him the scroll of Isaiah. And it's this verse 61. And Jesus reads Isaiah's words to those gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth. And then he proclaims. Because now he's anointed, right? He's anointed. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And he walks into the temple. And he reads these words in the synagogue in Nazareth. And he proclaims. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Let me ask you the question. When you read the words of Isaiah the prophet, do you say, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears? That's the challenge this morning. Can we read Isaiah 61? Can we read in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus does exactly that? And, but do, when we read it for ourselves, can we say, today the scripture is fulfilled? In other words, a fulfillment is only when it's fulfilled. All those things included in what it's meant to be accomplished is being fulfilled. Jesus would demonstrate during his ministry, his death and resurrection, the very fulfillment of this passage in Isaiah. Jesus preached to the meek that all be saved through faith in his name. He bound up the, the, the brokenhearted and healed the blind, the lame, those overwhelmed by evil spirits and those overcome by grief due to the death of a loved one. He proclaimed liberty to the captors by freeing the burden from their sins and opening the spirit prison of those bound by lack of knowledge. He walked amongst the people of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea, and all the while reaching out to the poor and the needy, the caring for the widows and the orphans and blessing the strangers. In every deed, come on, everybody say every deed. Jesus of Nazareth was a living embodiment of the compassion and mercy taught by the law of Moses. And he would extend his compassion and mercy to all of us here today. The, that's the very thing that we stood early on praying for, that God would intervene on our behalf. When you say, God, I need a miracle. You know, the Bible says in the end of Re Revelation that, that you'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb, in other words, the work of Jesus on the cross, and the word of your testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. A testimony is a divine contribution of God, a divine work of God in your life. It's where God intervenes on your behalf, when God does something that you cannot do, when he does a miracle, and it's where you can say, no, only God. That, that is your testimony of the divine intervention of God in your life, which means we need to see fulfillment. We need to take the hands because he's taking our hands today. And I was moved when I read this, and it reflects our world as it is today in Job 22. And it says in verse 5, 
is not your wickedness great? There is no end to your iniquities, for you have exacted pledges from your family for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have given no water to the weary to drink, and you have withheld bread for the hungry. The powerful possess the land, and the favored live in it. You have sent widows away empty-handed. And then those last few words just broke my heart. The arms of the orphans you have crushed. I want to read a true story that happened this year, just recently, and we're working with him still. It's a boy about, about the name of Wilson. Uh, he's an, alb- an American, say, albino. We say albino, albino. We'll still say it's albino. Um, and so Wilson is a young 14-year-old boy from the district of Zambezia province in, in Mozambique. He was born an alb- albino, and unfortunately, this has severely marked his life. People with albinism in Mozambique are often victims of persecution, violence, and discrimination due to myths and superstitions, which include the use of organs or bones in the witchcraft rituals, making them the main targets for human rights violations. According to authorities, the crime that occurred with Wilson may be related to to these superstitious practices, and in most cases, criminals receive orders from other people who intend to sell human organs. uh, A crime occurred in November the 18th in the district of uh, Ili, Four men took Wilson, who was sleeping on his balcony, to a forest and amputated his right arm. No anesthetic, just roughly took a saw and cut his right arm off. They also tried to amputate amputate his left arm, but they fled when they became aware of the arrival of the teenager's relatives. And you can know why, because that poor boy was screaming. According to the police, there are no arrests yet. But it is suspected that one of the teenagers' uncles is involved in the case. Wilson was transferred from hospital to hospital until he finally arrived in the central hospital in Kilimani, where we have our main base. And he underwent several surgeries. And this is where our life child community health workers connected with Wilson. We have over 20 healthcare workers that are going to community and work with the community. And so we had heard about him and and so they connected with Wilson. And Life Child began an urgent intervention for, of health and nutritional support and prayers. Wilson lost so much blood and was largely on his own with his aunt. And there was no support system around them. Very, very poor people. Dershow, one of my, our pastors, who is a Life Child's trauma counselor, continues to walk closely with Wilson and his aunt. Today, Life Child is working with social welfare in our desired placement of Wilson in our Akalawa Children's Village. We have a beautiful children's village where we're able to love and care for Wilson. In a safe and healthy place. Helping him to understand who Jesus is and his wonderful plans for Wilson. Life child is in conversations for a future. I'm a guy, we don't use dishes. I'm a man. Thank you so much. There we go. Life child is in conversations for a future prosthetic arm, which will also make a huge difference in his future. And so would you keep Wilson in your prayers because he's not a commodity to be used to prosper, but a child who deserves to be happy, safe, and able to live the life that God has planned for him. Psalm 82 verse 3 says, Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. He lost his hand, but Jesus came and took the hand that he had. See, you, 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 United Church, make the word come true. That's the only way this world that is so dark and lost will know who Jesus is when you make the word come true. Psalm 10 verse 14 says, But do you see indeed and note trouble and grief that you may take it into your hands? The helpless commit themselves to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. It's in your hands. The truth here today is that there is a cry. In Psalm 72, verse 17 says, For he will rescue the needy when he cries for help, the afflicted and abused also, and him who has no helper. God says, I will rescue them. How does he rescue them? He rescues them through you. You're his hands and you're his feet. You're his eyes. You're his heart. You are Jesus to community. And you might go like, hang on, I don't think Jesus knows who I am. No, he knows exactly who you are. And he takes you as you are and he will use you. He will change you. He loves you too much to leave you as you are. But he will change you. But he will use you. Because there's too many people that are crying. 
This is the heart of God. And when we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. We are actually saying, God, I want to be like you. I want to do what you do. And really, as we, we have a few minutes left, the truth is when we hear God, when we hear God hears us. When we hear God hears us. Proverbs includes the sobering, the sobering proverb. It says in Proverbs 21 verse 13, if you close your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry and not be heard. If you close your ear, your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry out and not be heard. You hear, God hears. You move, God moves. In every deed, Jesus of Nazareth was the embodiment of compassion and mercy. We as his covenant people are called to be like him. At the end of, the ministry, of his ministry, Jesus invites us all to imitate his compassion and mercy. At the end of his life on earth, before he was crucified, in, verse, in Matthew 25, he describes what he's looking for, what he wants, what we kind of people would be to be. And it says, and he gives them an illustration. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? It will say, when? when? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? When? It will say, when? Did we see you a stranger invite you in and needing clothes and clothe you? When? when? Thank you for the three people. When? 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 Not a way to. When? when? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Boom, drop the mic. You know, we, the only whatever we know is like when we're children. Ah, whatever, whatever. That's almost like disconnecting. No, whatever you do for me. And for the least of these, you did for me. Without Christ, we have an orphan spirit as we close. Worship team can come up. Without Christ, we have an orphan spirit. We are dead to Christ. We are spiritually, we're dead spiritually and far removed from our heavenly father. But in Christ, you're not left alone. You're not left as an orphan. We are spiritually orphaned when we are, when we are lost, far from God, no covenant relationship with Him, doing our own thing, building our own worlds, building our own lives. But He doesn't leave us as a spiritual orphan. He comes to find us. John 14 says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father and He'll give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because he neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells within you and will be in you. Watch this, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. Jesus comes to take your hand today. Let's not be like Jesus, let's, let's be like Jesus, not like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, where they didn't strengthen their hand and of the poor and the needy. Let's take the hand of, the, of an orphan today. God has a promise for you today. It says in Isaiah 58 verse 10, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. In Acts 20 it says, in all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, one of the most beautiful pictures and illustration of Jesus reaching out was he's on the cross and in fact he couldn't physically reach out because he was nailed to the cross and he hangs there and he looks down and there's John, one of his disciples, his mother Mary because she was already a widow but he was taking care of her. He was the oldest. And he looks down at John and he says, John, and he looks to his mother and he says, John, this is your mother. And he says to his mother, mother, this is your son. While he's on the cross, his heart is for people to be cared for, to be rescued, to be put in safe places, to be, to be ripped away from that which breaks and which brings people into bondage. Jesus says in John 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life 
and have it abundantly. So even on the cross, he's, he's making sure that this would, uh, would be taken care of. It just shows me who God is. So as he reaches out to you today, would you, would you be his hands and his feet? We believe that this message was helpful to you. We'd love to stay in contact with you. So why don't you follow us on Instagram at United Church SA or contact us on our WhatsApp number. Be blessed.